please forgive me if I butcher these names. Some of them I look up and every different pronunciation is different. Uh, so I'm trying. Hello, Finns and friends, Siren Sapphire here. I have this lovely new backdrop. Got these pretty lights and a bunch of trinkets and fan art and stuff. I love it so much. Now, I keep sneezing for some reason in this room, so I'm so sorry if I sound congested. That's, that's why. I don't know why I'm sneezing. I just am. It's Sunday, which means it's time for some folklore. Today, we will be diving into not one, not two, but three stories of water spirits and creatures from Mexico. So let's dive right in with story number one. Our first story may be the most famous ghost story in the world, with multiple movies and TV shows and pop culture references. So let's dive in to the story of La Llorona. The Weeping Woman is one of the most told ghost stories in Latin America and Spanish-speaking communities. La Llorona is a little different than other water spirits or creatures that we talk about because she's not technically a water spirit or a water creature. Instead, she's a wandering malicious spirit that's just very associated with water. Like many other folklore, there are a lot of different variations about her appearance, her actions, her backstory. One of the interpretations that I came across that kind of piqued my interest a little more into La Llorona was one by Bess Hayes, who says, Sometimes she takes the form of a dangerous siren, tempting a solitary male later at night, confronting him as a pitiful, woebegone figure hidden under a rebozo. According to legend, before La Llorona was the wandering weeping spirit that she is today, she was a beautiful girl who lived in a small village named Maria. She caught the attention of a wealthy man who proposed to her, and the two got married. He promised her a lush lifestyle, and after getting married, the two had two children together. Maria loved her children with all her heart and cared for them every day. However, the children's wealthy father was not as present in their life. As time went on, he became more and more distant from his family. The father would be gone for days on end, sometimes weeks, and then one day he left and never came back. Sometime after this, Maria was out in the river with her two children. The three were playing in the water together when Maria saw her husband, and he was with another woman. Maria felt her heart quicken and tighten in her chest. Her world was shattered. She looked at her two children, the children that belonged to that man that just broke her heart, the children that belonged to that monster. As the days went on, any time Maria looked at her children, all she felt was anger and hatred. She would relive that moment, and one night, she'd had enough. She took her two children back to that river and drowned them. After it was done, she came to her senses and realized what she had done. She spent days after her children's death wandering the riverside in her white dress, calling out for her children and weeping. Eventually, when she was too weak to continue her search, she threw herself into the river in an effort to be united with her children in the afterlife. However, her spirit became lost. Some tellings say that when her spirit reached the gates of heaven, she was asked about where the souls of her children were and was sent back down to earth until she could find them. Now, her spirit wanders along bodies of water, still wearing that same white dress, searching for her children, and often attacking any men that wander a little too close, thinking that they are her unfaithful husband. La Llorona will kidnap children and ask them for forgiveness before drowning them or killing them in order for them to take the place of her own children. 
In most depictions of La Llorona, she is around some body of water and in her appearance looks as though she's just climbed out of it. Her long dark hair drips with water underneath her veil, which covers her white skin, stained with black tears from centuries of weeping. Some say that her eyes are so filled with tears that they are just white glazed over. She's seen wearing the same white gown that she wore when she was alive, wandering around looking for her children. And all these details about the appearance of La Llorona make sense when you consider her backstory. Now, many people believe that La Llorona is a made-up ghost story created to keep children away from dark waters at night. But this next tale has made many people wonder if these creatures are simply mythology or if they truly existed. Ahuizo, or Thorny One of the Water, as their name translates, are water creatures from Aztec folklore. Like I said, it is uncertain if these creatures actually existed, or if they were just legends made up to explain the deaths of local fishermen in the dangerous waters of Mexico. They are described as dog-like creatures, with short black fur that becomes spiky when it's wet, rubbery, shiny skin, short pointed ears, paws that are more like monkey hands than actual paws, and a long dark tail with a hand on the end of it. These creatures would lay in rivers or lakes, waiting for their prey, usually fishermen, to venture just a little too deep into the water. Once their prey is in sight, they strike, pulling the victim headfirst into the water using their hand tail thing. Occasionally, they would get tired of waiting and they would mimic the sounds of babies crying to lure people into the water. Onlookers would always know if someone was being attacked because the water would appear like it was boiling, with fish and frogs being thrown into the air. After drowning their victims, these creatures would very carefully and meticulously remove the victim's eyes, teeth, and nails. This was able to be recorded because a few days to a few weeks after the attack, the body would float to the surface. But not anyone could go and retrieve this body. The Aquisult were considered to be minions to the rain god Tlaloc, so only a priest would be able to remove the body out of the water. Because of their association with the water deity, it was also said that those souls drowned by the hands of the Aquisult would be taken to the paradise of Tolokoket. It is believed that this fate would happen for one of two reasons. Either because the individual was loyal to the gods and the gods wanted to reward them, or they had committed some kind of sin against the deities and were brought there as an offering. Now, Tolokok was not the only water god of the Aztec people. And our next story will take a look at his wife slash sister goddess, goddess of the rivers, lakes, and streams, Chalchu Chikwe. Her name translates to she who wears a jade skirt, and in the Aztec religion was created at the same time as Tlaloc, the god of rain. In some versions, they're considered siblings because they were created alongside each other. But others say that they were created to be husband and wife, so that's why there's a little confusion on whether she's his sister or his wife. But whatever their relationship, the two water gods would often work together to provide life-sustaining water to the plants, the animals, and the people. Chalchilchikwe is not only the goddess of water, but also the patron of children and the sick. With it being said that her water often possesses healing powers, she was a powerful deity that genuinely cared for people. In Aztec mythology, the gods created the world five times. So there were five different suns that each god was in charge of, along with the world that went along with that sun. Chachulue was in charge of the fourth sun. When she reigned over the sun, the sea creatures in the water was plentiful. 
She would care for the world, the animals, and the people that adored her for 676 years. But then, everything changed. The god of the first sun was so jealous of the adoration her people had for her that he accused her of faking her care and love for her people. The tender-hearted goddess was so hurt by this accusation that she cried for 52 years. She must be a cancer. In some tellings, she cried blood, while in other tellings, she just cried water. It would be a mix of both, we don't know. But in all the stories, she cried so many tears that it flooded the whole earth with water. The people of that world had to survive by turning into fish because there was no dry land left, resulting in some fish, some half human, half fish. Sound familiar? Maybe that's how we got more people. Although she was loved for her gifts and her water, she was also feared. She was said to be responsible for deadly storms, floods, and drowning. Because of this potential for disaster, the people would often give her sacrifices and offerings in order to keep her pleased. She's often depicted wearing a headdress with tassels that hang down on either side. And as her name suggests, she's often depicted wearing a green skirt, sometimes with water flowing out of it. She is also often depicted either kneeling or sitting on a red stool. She's often also shown around young children, representing her relationship to fertility and childbirth. Now, looking at all these stories, I think we can find parallels and see the danger, but also the reverence that people had for water. So next time you hear someone crying by a river, or see some water bubbling in a stream. Swim safely, my fishes. You never know who might be watching. If you enjoyed these stories today and you want more folklore in your life, hit that follow button, like this video, and comment what culture you want to see next or if there's any specific water creature, water spirit you want me to cover. I hope you all have an amazing day and I will see you later. Okay, bye.